to share with you one verse of scripture and it's Galatians chapter 6 and the familiar 14th verse that says God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I am crucified unto the world. If there ever was a man who had reasons to glory if he wanted to, it would be the Apostle Paul. If he wanted to glory, he could glory about his education. He studied at the feet of the greatest scholar of his day, Gamaliel. If he wanted to glory, he can glory in his race. He was of the tribe of Benjamin and he was of the stock of Israel. If he wanted to glory, he could glory in his religion. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He could glory in his self-righteousness. As touching the law, he said, I was blameless. He could glory in his unique conversion because our Lord Jesus personally appeared to him and spoke to him on that Damascus road. If he wanted a glory, he could glory in his achievement uh, and uh, of the fact that he wrote half of the New Testament and he planted churches all over Asia Minor and Europe and raised leaders of great level in all of those places. If he wanted the glory, he could glory in a success as a minister of the gospel of Christ. For every known gift of the Spirit was present in his life and ministry. But he said this, he said, but the things that were gained to me, these I counted but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Now Paul says God forbid that I should glory. I want to share with you first of all. I want you to pause with me to consider the first uh, of three crucifixion he talks about in that verse. First the crucified Christ. He says God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the cross is not a threshold for uh, our selfish attainment. Many might use it to promote themselves, but the cross is a terminal to selfishness. God has designed that it should only be used to bring men to himself. The cross allows us to live our lives not to ourselves, but live our life to God. Four times in Romans chapter 6, the apostle emphasized the key is a living your life unto God and not for self or others. He said in verse 10, live unto God. In verse 11, alive unto God. In verse 13, he says, present your, yourself as instruments unto God. Again, in verse 13, he says, yield yourselves unto God. In fact, what he is saying is that whatever we do, even out here, we do it as unto the Lord. Hallelujah. Our worship is unto God. Our service is unto God. Our singing is unto God. Our ministry is unto God. And whatever we do is not unto man, but unto the honor and glory of God. Can I hear somebody say amen? Praise the Lord. Amen. You see, Paul's life was about the redemptive work of Christ on the cross. It doesn't matter what subject he's talking about like he was talking about raising 
offering for the poor people in Jerusalem, the poor saints. But whatever he's talking about, he will make a beeline right back to the cross. And he he's talking about money. And all of a sudden he says, we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich for your sake, he became poor, that we through his poverty can become rich. Hallelujah. You see, he could not talk about anything without talking about a cross. Regardless where he preached or to whom he preached, he preached the message of the cross. And so to the Corinthians, he said this, I am determined not to know anything among you but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Again, he told them in 1 Corinthians 15, I deliver unto you the gospel which also I preach how that Christ died for our sins according to the gospel and he rose again from the on the third day according to the gospel. He also said about that to the Corinthians in chapter 1, he said for the Jews seek for signs and they're looking for a, a, a particular sign and the Greeks are looking for wisdom and they're wanting to indulge in Gnosticism but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jew uh, an offense uh, unto the Greek uh, he, uh, 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 unto the Gentile it's absurd and utter philosophical nonsense but unto us that are saved it is the power of God. Hallelujah somebody. Praise the Lord. You see the cross uh, it, it was invented by the Persians and it was borrowed by the Romans and perfected by the Romans and it became the most cruel and the most painful form of death that anyone could, could think about. There is so much of crossless preaching in our day. To, to leave the cross out is to take the sun out of the sky to leave the cross out is to take our heart out of the body because the cross is the main theme of the Old Testament it is the soul of the New Testament even in heaven and throughout all eternity the cross stands forth in splendor and glory the devil does not care if you have religion as long as the cross is left out in fact the world approves religion apart from the gospel of Jesus because the gospel says we are sinners and we need to be saved and if you have not read your Bible from Golgotha's ground you have not yet read your Bible at all you have to read it in the light of Calvary you must understand that the cross is a crux and the cross is the foundation and from there all the blessings that we will ever receive in this life, our eternal hope, our eternal blessings are flowing. Come on, somebody, from the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. You see, before God can forgive sins, the sin question has to be dealt with properly. No sane or proper theology can overlook what the Bible calls the wrath of God if sin uh, da, does not displease God he is simply not a righteous God if right and wrong is alike to him he is not worthy of our praise there must be a perfect balance between his perfect love and his holy hate there must be a perfect balance between his compassion his mercy and his justice because you see on one side his mercy says I want to forgive you I want to change you I want to deliver you but his justice over there said no 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 you just can't do that my laws were violated and my laws have to be dealt with and his mercy and compassion said but I want to forgive you I want to give you eternal life I want to take you to heaven but God's justice over there said oh no you can't just do that 
because uh, my laws have been violated and the cross came in the middle hallelujah somebody and the Bible says that the cross of Calvary mercy and grace met each other righteousness and peace kiss each other Barton listen to me that's the greatest kiss this world has ever known it was a kiss that occurred at Calvary because God's mercy on the one hand ah, and God's righteousness met each other at the cross and kiss you see what the Bible is teaching us is that every one of you here all of us here we got two men living with us. Now, let me be careful. I didn't say you're living with two men. But I'm saying all of that's got two men living inside of us. One is called the old man. That means the Adamic nature we were born with when we first came into this world. And one is called the second man. Before I can experience the Lord's blessing, I, the old man, need the work of the cross. It needs redemption. It needs forgiveness. It needs reconciliation. It needs regeneration. The old man needs that. But after I have come and experienced the work of the cross in my life, I am now called upon, listen to me, I am now called upon to embrace the way of the cross. I don't embrace the way of the cross first. I need the work of the cross in my life. The work of redemption. The work of reconciliation. The work of regeneration. That changes me and transforms me. And after that has happened, I embrace the way of the cross. And what is the way of the cross? It is an uncompromising way. The way of the cross means there are some things you got to stand for. There is something that you got to stand form for. Hallelujah. And you would not give up. The way of the cross is a way of submission. Not my will but your will be done. The way of the cross is a, is a way of humility. He humbled himself and became obedient to death. Even the death of the cross. Wherefore God has highly exalted him. It is a way of submission. A way that is uncompromising. It is a way. The way of the cross is a way of humility. It is an unselfish way. It is a way of sacrifice. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. The Bible says despising the cross, forsaken as shame, and he is sat down on the right hand of the majesty and high. The cross uh, will break our connection with, with, with our self-life. You know, between the old rugged cross today, we have a modern cross. And a lot of people are, uh, are following the modern cross. The modern cross will allow you to live your life undisturbed. Uh, will allow you to do a little bit of this and a little bit of that. But the old rugged cross will cut deep into that life. Anybody with me? The, the modern cross will say come and get. The old rugged cross will say come and give. The modern cross will say if you're serving the Lord, your needs will always be met. You will drive the biggest car. You'll live in the biggest house. You'll never get sick. But the old rugged cross says that's not true. The old rugged cross says they that will live godly in Christ shall suffer persecution. You know friend we need to recognize that the cross is going to cut deep in our life. You know we are so wrapped up with self and entwined by self and self has such a control upon our life. We are so taken up by this. You know, and here Paul is talking about the crucified Christ. He says, by God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of the Lord. That's the crucified Christ. But look with me on that verse again and you'll see the crucified self by which I am crucified unto the world. The crucified Christ will lead to the crucified self. 
In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, he said, I am crucified with Christ. I live yet nevertheless. It is not I that live. It is Christ that lives in me and the life that I now live. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. Come on, somebody. You, uh, you see the, the amen. Wonderful. You see, the Christian life is not a just a change life. The Christian life is an exchange life. He takes mine and he gives me his. Oh, he takes my garment of sin and he put on his robe of righteousness upon me. And when I stand or I sit right now in the house of God, even though it's outside the building, I stand and sit in a complete and I sit in good relationship with, with the Lord. You see, friend, the Christian life is not a self-life. It is the Christ life. It is not a life living on to self, but it is a crucified life that has been crucified. Uh, uh, you know, God has begun to deal with that self life inside of us. We we need to come to a place where self is crucified, where self is brought to the cross. Hallelujah! When the great artist Michelangelo would do one of his masterpiece. He would always put a light on his forehead, on his head. And someone came to him and said, Why do you always put a light in front of your head? He said, Because I have to throw away the shadow of self upon my work. Because the shadow of self will come upon the best things that you are doing for God. And will mar your, your labor for the Lord. And so he said, I have to throw off the shadow of self self uh, and uh, and therefore I, I, I am putting that light on so I can throw off the shadows and you see I can't I'm talking to you here but I don't look on the ground everywhere I walk I see a shadow it, listen don't mind how far you run you don't mind which church you go to shadow of self going to still be with you. Hallelujah. The greatest thing in serving God is letting the cross deal with our self life. Hallelujah. I heard the story of this lady who met her her childhood and school days a sweetheart and they fell in love and they had a great marriage and they had a happy life in the early days and all of a sudden this man got sick and he died and the lady wanted to take a break she went for a vacation in Europe and while she was in Europe she met a man that swept her off her feet and they got married and they had a whirlwind honeymoon and after that uh, wonderful time they decided to come back and live in our house in America and when they came to our house as the custom was he lifted her up in his arms to carry her over the threshold of the house but as he went through the door he almost dropped her to the ground because he looked in the corner and saw <laughs> someone embalm and he almost said, who's that? She said, oh, I forget to tell you. That's my husband, John. I never bury him. I just embalm him and put him in a corner in my house. You see, a lot of people are serving God, but they embalm self. They allow self to still dictate and be there. But God is teaching us in his word. There has to come a time when self is crucified. What is the apostle Paul saying when he said this. Paul was saying, he said, when Jesus died, I died. When Jesus arose, I arose. When Jesus ascended, I ascended. When Jesus sat at the right hand of the majesty and I, I sat at the right hand. He is talking about a union, a mystical, real union with Jesus. And, who, and as he is today, so are we going to be in this world. You and I have 
the enemy of the flesh and the world and the devil but the Lord is dealing with that self life hallelujah it is a great thing to see self come to the altar and fully surrender and say Lord your will be done in my life now if you look back at this verse with me one more time he says God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ you see the crucified Christ the crucified self but thirdly I want you to see the crucified world he said by which the world is crucified unto me the world is crucified unto me and I am crucified unto the world between Paul and the world stood the cross of Jesus Christ. How many of you remember the song we used to sing? Take the whole world, but give me Jesus. <laughs> Take the whole world. Anybody remember that? <laughs> if you don't remember. <laughs> that, uh, are you remember we used to sing? The cross before me. <laughs> and what? The world behind me. You know, we still need to go back to that in practice and in living. The cross before me and the world behind me. What Paul is teaching here is that just as a blind man is dead to uh, color and just like a deaf man is dead to sound the believer by virtue of his union with Jesus Christ is dead to the attraction of this world the Bible teaches us that there are two kingdoms in this world and there are two kings in this world Colossians 1 verse 13 says you had he he had translated you from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son if you are a child of God this world will become dimmer and dimmer and dimmer to you and Jesus will become come on somebody brighter and brighter and brighter to you hallelujah if you are a child of God what is going to happen yeah. uh, you will experience the precious goodness of the Lord because you see friend here's what the Bible says love not the world neither the things they're talking about a system of this world neither the things that are in the world because when you start loving the world you will then secondly become a friend of the world and the Bible says friendship with this world is enmity with God when you love it you become a friend and before after becoming a friend you will be confirmed to this world and the Bible says be not confirmed to the world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind the values of this world is not the values of God you can live with the value of, of, it, of, of, of culture. You can let the culture put the value in your home and the value in your children's life and the value in your Christian walk. Your value must come from the word of Almighty God. Hallelujah. There's power in this word. I know that today churches are faced with a lot of things and I've been a preacher for the last 53 years of my life. And I can tell you of the transformation culturally that we have experienced in the church. There is so much a transformation. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, but uh, I want you to know, friend, it will not be the technology that will bring the difference in the church. It will not be all the, the artistic things that we will have. It will not be the improvement in this and that. It will still be the anointing of the Spirit of Almighty God and the power of God in our life and oh that the church will never give up intercessory prayer that the church will never give up prevailing prayer that the church will never give up that they need to win the battle on their knees and before God hallelujah and if the church will pray and know how to pray and depend upon God there is nothing that God cannot do Hallelujah. There's nothing God won't be able to do for you if you'll be able to do that. When Paul says, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross, he is not referring to two pieces of wood put together. But when he talked about the cross, he is talking about, number one, the person of the cross. 
He knew the person of the cross. God wants all of us to know the person of the cross. He hated the name of Jesus. He was a persecutor, a blasphemer. He was an insolent person. But he met the person of the cross personally. And he became the great apostle Paul and wrote half of our New Testament. And I want you to know that when we know the person of the cross, uh, Christ in you is the hope of glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, I haven't done so many funerals. I don't know about you, Pastor Mike, but I have done more funerals in the last year and a half than I have done in any period of my life. Almost every couple of weeks, every two weeks, every other week, I'm called to do a funeral. But when you go to funerals, the preachers not only try to tell everybody to please them that that person is in heaven. I want you to know, friend, unless you know the person of the cross, unless you know the person of the cross. And Christ in you is the hope of glory. The Bible says, whom to know, if you know the Son, you have life everlasting. And if you don't know the Son, the wrath of God abided with you. Now when Paul says, uh, God forbid that I should glow in the cross, he's talking about the person of the cross. For, secondly, he's talking about the power of the cross. There is such power in the cross of Jesus and that's why he, he said in 1 Corinthians 1 18 he said God <laughs> making it clear that a preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish foolishly but unto us that are saved it is the power of God and you know that verse from Romans 1 16 that says I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus why it is the what it say it with me everybody it is the power of God unto salvation there is power in the gospel resurrection power there's transforming power liberating power power that set people free a lady just came to our church maybe about six months ago and she she had demonic influences over her life she was introduced to me by someone and she said pastor i went to an obia man you know who that is and i paid a man nine thousand dollars and i'm worse and now the man called me back and said if you give me seventy thousand I can help you. But she, unfortunately, she's in Mississauga, ran into somebody, you know, us a little bit, and they brought her. She was baptized two weeks ago. <laughs> Hallelujah. God set her free. Hallelujah. You see, there was power in the cross. They put Peter in prison, intending the next day to kill him. What did the church do? Did they walk around with black cards, uh, uh, black cards in their hand and had a demonstration and walk down the streets and start demonstrating against what the authorities are doing? No, they gather in a home and they decided to pray. Hallelujah. You would sing and hear the song, chains are falling, but he was chained to four soldiers. Ah, and while the church is praying, an angel of God came in that prison and the chains fell off <laughs> and chain fell off and prison door were open and when he came knocking at the door where the prayer meeting was held they believed that he was dead and there was a spirit but oh he said no it's me hallelujah you've been praying for this and God did it for me hallelujah that's the power of the cross amen and then finally when he talks about the cross He's talking about God wants us to know the person of the cross, the power of the cross, and the purpose of the cross. What is the purpose of the cross? To bring a brand new people to God. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. That is, God remove you from the Adamic nature into a new creation. Hebrews chapter 2 says, 
it was fitting for him by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory. Hallelujah. To make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. You see, friend, God had in eternity one day, he had his only begotten son in the triune God. And he was so pleased with his only begotten son that he wanted a whole vast generations of men and women, sons and daughters, that will be in the image of his only begotten son. And right now, you and I, on this journey, this Christian journey, while we're serving God here, is that we will, oh, praise God, be more and more confirmed to the image of his son. Glory to God, the Sunday! When you see him, what the Bible says, you will be like him. I want you to pray with me today. I want to encourage you. Because God wants you and I to experience the person, the power, and the purpose of the cross of Jesus. The crucified Christ, the crucified self, and the crucified world. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for people's assembly we thank you for the leadership of this church, for the workers, for all of them that have been working to make this church be a life witness in this community. It may not look like we're doing something that is uh, so very special, but Lord, you are doing something wonderful. And I pray that, oh God, you will touch lives here. If there is somebody that, online that do not know Jesus as their personal Savior, have never surrendered their lives to him, I pray pray that right now the Holy Spirit will speak to them. I ask you to turn your heart open and Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart. Ask him to come and say, Lord, come in my life. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me in your blood and make me clean. I accept you as my Savior and as my Lord. And I promise you that if you will right now open your heart and trust the Lord Jesus Christ, he'll come in your life. He'll change you. He'll make it totally different for you. Hallelujah. Things that are in front of you, when God turned you around, here's what happened. Things that are against you, that are in front of you, what, here's what God do. He turns you around and all of a sudden those things come behind of you because He gives you a new direction in your life. Hallelujah. And you are going in a different way. Father, we pray today that you'll meet every need. You'll touch lives with the honor and glory of God. And we give you the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord.